I turned it on. We're talking about finishing well this morning. This is an appropriate passage. This is the inerrant living word of God, the Apostle Paul wrote. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Father, we come before you as those who have loved your appearing. Lord, we want to be finishers. We want to hear your word now and apply it for your glory. And we praise you, Father, for giving your son who finished his work well. We love you. We praise you for this time uh, to hear your word, to think about your word. And we commit our hearts to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we can't get too much closer to the end of a calendar year than uh, where we are right now. I was reading recently, uh, John Piper, many of you know him and listen to Desiring God. So John Piper wrote many years ago, I think this was in a sermon, it was like sermon 20 years ago maybe, and he talked about how, this is very interesting to me, how he looks at the end of a given year and he called it a rehearsal. And when I first read that, I thought, well, that's interesting. He called it a trial run kind of like a practice. And he said this, this is kind of a quote, and I'll put 2023 in it. This was 20 years ago when he asked it to his congregation. But he said, if 2023 were the whole of your life, could you say with Paul, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, or I have finished the course. I have kept the faith, I have kept the word of God. Well, it's a great time to review a year. Many of you do that, I know. And it's good to think about goals, and I'll talk about that in a minute, why it is good to do that. But those spur us on, I believe. It's good to have goals. Goals set and given by the Lord uh, based on his word. And they're not meant to discourage you. I know if you set, make too many of them and they're grandiose, then it can be discouraging, I suppose. But Moses prayed this in Psalm 90, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. That's the heart we should have at the end of a year, beginning of a new year. So how did you finish 2023? Don Whitney, if you look on the back now uh, of your notes, how many years have I given this out? I don't know, 15 years, something like that. Uh, I guess I'm gonna give it out until some of you tell me you really uh, really (laughs) liked it. No, so I know many of you are doing this. You're being faithful, you're working on your goals, you've been greatly blessed in doing that. So I just wanna read, I haven't read this for years, but at the top it says, Don Whitney wrote, uh, once when the people of God had become careless in their relationship with him, the Lord rebuked them through the prophet Haggai. And that's Haggai 1.5, consider your ways. He declared, urging them to reflect on some of the things happening to them and to evaluate their slipshod spirituality in light of what God had told them. Even those most faithful to God occasionally need to pause and to think about the direction of their lives. Indeed. It's so easy to bump along from one busy week to another without ever stopping to ponder where are we going, where are we going, and where we should be going. And then he says, the beginning of a new year is an ideal time to stop, to look up, and to get our bearings. And I like that phrase, to get our bearings. We need to set our bearings. We need to be going forward in the way the Lord has called us to go forward. Certainly that is according to his word. And if you look at number 10, I think that's the one, one question I'll just highlight here uh, as you think, maybe think about these tomorrow. Number 10 says, what single thing that you plan to do this year will matter most in 10 years? And then it says, will matter most in eternity. And I would say, would matter most to the end of your life, to making you a finisher. So Paul knew that he was going to depart. And this is why he, he was saying this here. And this is his last, he was saying this from prison, his last letter. And he, he was going to depart, he said, and be with Christ. And he really desired to do so. He'd rather be there. He said, for I'm, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is in hand. A lot of us won't know that time. He knew that time. And he knew he was soon to uh, come before the Lord. And he was rejoicing in that. 
And he said, I'm being poured out as like an Old Testament sacrifice. That's part of some of the uh, Old Testament sacrifice, sacrificial system. So he considered himself also a living sacrifice his whole life. And his attitude is seen in Acts chapter 20, which I think is one of the key cross-references in this. Acts chapter 20, verses 23 and 24. And he said this, and he was talking to the Ephesian elders. He's saying goodbye to them. He's saying, I'm never gonna see you again. And this is what he said. I know that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Many of us don't know that either. Some of our brothers that we prayed for this morning do, do know that, that chains and tribulations await them if they speak the truth of the gospel. And then he said, Paul said, but none of these things move me. He said, nothing's gonna move me off of this course that the Lord has called me to be on. Nor do I count my life dear to myself. It's okay if I give my life for this cause. And then he said this, so that I may finish my race with joy. He wanted to be a finisher, but he wanted to finish with joy. And because, in particular, he said, and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. His joy would be to be proclaiming the good news till the day he died. I believe that's probably what he did. And he looked forward to the crown. He looked forward to the crown. Actually, it wasn't so much a crown like you're maybe thinking of right now, a king, kingly crown, gold and all that. It was a wreath, probably a wreath. It was a finisher's wreath. And he said, that's what I want. That's laid up for me. It was kept for him, like all treasures in Christ are kept for us, laid up where they can't fade. First Peter, in fact, clarifies this. It says that, we were begotten again to a, a living hope. In other words, we were born again. We should be living in hope at all times in Jesus Christ because of the power of the resurrection. And then he said, the apostle Peter said, we're to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away. It cannot fade away, praise God. It's reserved in heaven for you. Think of that, it's reserved. This wreath that the Lord Jesus will place upon you. And then it says, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. So it's interesting. The wreath is kept for us. What a blessing. But we are kept to receive it. What a blessing. And the Lord is the one who keeps us by his power. Paul wrote this at an earlier time. He wrote this in the book of Philippians, earlier than the letter to uh, Timothy. He said, verse 21, for to me, to live is Christ. So as long as I live, he is my focus. He is my life. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. He wanted to be fruitful also until the day the Lord called him home. Yet, what shall I choose? I cannot tell. Well, he couldn't really. Uh, for I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. So he had a desire to depart and be with Christ, far better. But he also had a desire to continue bearing fruit, all for Christ. Everything was for the Lord Jesus. And in the normal course of life, my departure is closer than many of yours. I've been thinking a lot about what it means to finish well at this stage of my life for Sherry and I, at this stage of our lives. I've been thinking about that, probably for about six months. Six months ago, I read this passage, and I started meditating on it, and I kept meditating, and then I came to the, I wasn't intending it, having a sermon on this, but I thought, I want you to be finishers too. So that's why I'm sharing this this morning. And I think it's important for us to think about this. It's not a morbid thing at all. It's a very healthy thing to think about. How am I doing? in this path? A am I on the path to be a finisher to glorify the Lord Jesus? We, we shouldn't fear discussing this topic or preparing for it. So I've been realizing this more and more physically, uh, some mentally, Phil and I both have. Phil mentioned that this morning. He testified of God's grace in a tough year. And, I, and we, we know we're not young anymore. Sometimes I think we exhort each other not to act that way because then we hurt ourselves. Um, but I feel young at heart. In fact, you know, uh, you all know I hurt myself because I think I'm 20 years younger than I am. But we shouldn't be unwilling to speak 
of or prepare for departure. It shouldn't cause fear. I'm aware that it will be soon, probably. It could be anyway, and and for me or for any of us. Paul was nearing his departure, and we are all moving along in the days determined for us. This past week, past Thursday, Bill Crilly and I met for fellowship. It's been a great blessing of mine for, I don't know, Bill, 12 years. We've been meeting almost every other week, maybe every third week. So we have fellowship, and we pray. Great blessing is my brother Bill to me. So we talked about what does it mean to be finishing. He's actually older than me. And we talked about what does it mean to be a finisher? And Bill was sharing and I I was sharing and we were talking about some people we know that didn't finish well. They didn't finish well. Believers and and unbelievers, certainly unbelievers, but they ended their lives actually because we were talking about them, remembering a few that they just, they're, they're focused on themselves. They focused on their pleasure and they're trying to achieve their bucket list. And when you think about their bucket list, it's all about traveling maybe, and I'm not against traveling, uh, but traveling just for the purpose of traveling, just to see beautiful places. Certainly that's good, reminds us of God's beautiful creation. So Bill feels the Lord may be showing him through his recent health challenges, many of you know, that he needs to prepare more to finish well. He said that he'd like to, th- this was his bucket list, which I thought was great. I, need, I wanna be more in the word of God. I wanna pray more, and I wanna do evangelism more. I wanna share the gospel more. You, you know that, you know Bill's, Bill would say that. That was his bucket list, praise God. And then he, at the end he said, my bucket list is to please the Lord. And of course we both agreed. So he was focusing on finishing spiritually, but also he has some practical matters, other things uh, that he has to deal with, and we all do. So in this passage, Paul said, with humility I believe and by the grace of God that he had fought the good fight, he had finished the race or the course, and he had kept the faith. He had been uh, steadfast in the word of God. So he fought the good fight. What does that mean? Paul used metaphors and used analogies, uh, athletic ones, and I think they're very helpful. And this one was a sport analogy. He said, thus I fight. This is 1 Corinthians 9, verses 26 and 27. 1 Corinthians 9. He said, this is the way I fight. Not as one just beating the air, but I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. He didn't want to be disqualified in this fight. So he fought the good fight. Well, what does that mean? Well, good here means, there's a couple words that will help you understand. What, what is a good fight? Well, it's worthy, it's honorable, it's noble, and it's a grand struggle. You're not just fighting to fight. Matthew Henry said, it is a good fight, a good warfare. The cause is good and the victory is sure if we continue faithful and courageous. J.C. Ryle said this is a little longer, similar. He said, let us settle it in our minds that the Christian fight is a good fight. Really good, truly good, emphatically good. You don't talk about fights usually that way. And then he said, we see only part of it yet. We see the struggle, but not the end. We see the campaign, but not the reward. We see the cross, but not the crown. We see a few humble, broken-spirited, penitent, praying people enduring hardships and despised by the world. And I was thinking of our saints in Nigeria and Azerbaijan. So we think of those people going through all that. But we see not the hand of God over them, the face of God smiling on them, the kingdom of glory prepared for them. These things are yet to be revealed. Let us not judge by appearances. There are more good things about the Christian warfare than we see. And I thought, maybe you did too, of Elisha. He didn't see all the chariots of fire. So the good fight is to be engaged in the battle, always engaged, in the battle with the world and its systems, with our own sinful flesh and with the demonic. Every day, year after year, without giving up, without throwing in the towel, for many years, to end the fight well, to finish the fight to the very end. Now in a fight, in a boxing match, throwing in the towel, maybe you all know what that means. 
um, you could throw that in and the boxer was essentially saying, I'm done, I, I need to surrender. Maybe he's getting hammered, the ref hasn't uh, called the fight yet for some reason, but he's basically saying, I'm defeated, I'm done, I can't take it anymore. But dear family, by the command of God and by his grace, we are to get back up after being knocked down. We're to battle with the word and prayer, which are our weapons. And as Daniel uh, Noor pointed out, uh, just back in October, he preached on Hebrews 12, one through three. He pointed out, in, in terms of confession, for example, confession after sin, we're to press on as we grow in holiness. We're to get back up, in other words, to grow in faith through that, to keep to the course, to become even stronger, to become sanctified. Now, Many of you know, <clears throat> I was on the Nebraska gymnastics team and I was, before I was a believer, it was too much of my life at South High School. Uh, it was my life. And in gymnastics, if you are competing and you're on the equipment and you fall off before the end, before your dismount, um, it's one of the hardest things mentally to do is to get back on, on that equipment. It's hard to even explain but you, you hit the ground before you ended, and you knew that probably any chance for you to uh, personally uh, have a medal is gone, so you already knew that. And there's people all around you watching you. There's your team there. So, to stay in the competition, you have to get back up. But there are other reasons too. Gymnastics is, even though you're out there by yourself, it's a team sport, your points will count. If you do not get back up, your team will lose even more than the one point you lost just by hitting the ground. One point is a lot in gymnastics, by the way. It can end a whole uh, competition just by your falling off. So you have to get up. Certainly you lost some momentum, you lost some points, but the shameful thing would be to not get back up. In fact, in all those years that I competed, I don't think I ever, maybe I saw one, I was trying to, this was 52 years ago. I could not remember, maybe just one person who in disgust walked off, very disgraceful, hurtful for his team, no person in that gym, it was not, not a good thing. Proverbs 24, 16 says, a righteous man may fall seven times, but rise again. But the wicked are overthrown by calamity. Dear family, you're in the first category there, not the second one. You can rise, you can get up. And it is the team, the body of Christ, the saints together who are meant to help each other to finish well. We're all in this together. Practicing the one another's as we've been learning enables us to be steadfast when we are suffering, when we're really going through a hard time, a battle. Christians who choose to be outside of the, the regular fellowship of the saints uh, in terms of a body of local believers, generally, uh, from my observation, they do not finish well. God gives grace to those isolated uh, for his sake, like the, some of the saints we have prayed for for many years who are isolated, they're in prison, they cannot fellowship. God gives grace. But a loner by choice is a very vulnerable person, especially in battle. But in our case, brothers and sisters, in this fight, in this race, the crown awaits us all by God's grace. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So Matthew Henry said, there is a crown of life before us, the crown of joy, of which will abundantly recompense all the hardships and the toils of our present warfare. Romans 8 says the same thing, verse 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Dear saints, we are in a good fight. I know it's painful. You are in a good fight and you are not alone, praise God. Fight the good fight of the faith. Fight as one who doesn't just beat the air, but who is disciplined, continuing to discipline yourself, and you're disciplined to do damage to the enemy. We should be doing that. I believe we are, by his grace. Your weapons are not in the flesh, but are mighty to destroy. Second Corinthians, verse 10, uses three action words. Pulling down, casting down, and bringing to captivity. That, I believe, is what the good fight 
looks like. That's what it does in the power of God and for his glory. That's what it does. We can't do it in our own strength. It'd be foolish. And Paul said he disciplined himself so as not to box aimlessly. I mean, when he hit, you know, it counted. He wasn't aimlessly boxing. He said, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. We have to discipline our hearts too. So did you finish the fight well in 2023? The Duff clan usually looks back at goals. We're gonna do that tomorrow. We look back at the goals we set last year. We'll kind of see how that, how that went and we'll be setting some new ones. So I believe that's very helpful. But are you preparing to fight spiritually, I guess is what I'm asking. Are you ready to fight? To finish well by fighting the good fight. Paul also said, I have finished the race. And another way to look at this is a course. So we have been put on this race, we've been put on this course by the sovereign God. Our lives as Christians is a course. It's not about winning against another runner. It can't stretch the metaphor that far. But it is about finishing our course to please the Lord. He sets the goal line. In fact, he is, he's at the goal line and he is the goal. 1 Corinthians 9 again says this. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Run in such a way. May we run in such a way this year. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Same word for disciplined. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. Just get rid of it when you're done. But we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, Paul said, I run this way, not with uncertainty. He had a plan. He's going forward. He was certain too. And he, he went forward with disciplined purpose and hope. May we do so. And so, in that list you have there, first of all, we finish well through personal discipline. We're to run in such a way to finish and temperate, again, means discipline. Like, it's like an athlete who daily works out, not during a time of competition, but getting ready for competition. They work out and they train, but not for a temporary crown. That isn't sufficient. A fleeting award. But we, we discipline ourselves for an eternal crown and for the words of the Lord that we have finished well. You work out daily because your goal is worth finishing. You are steady in the disciplines of grace. That's what I'm talking about here. You work out consistently, regularly, with the spiritual disciplines that you need to continue on course toward the goal. Don't find yourself weak from laziness when you are required to be strong in the Lord, strong in the day that he calls you home or in the day of trial. So we're to train ourselves in godliness, dear saints. First Timothy 4 the earlier letter to Timothy, Paul said this to him, train yourself or exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, so it's beneficial, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise for the life that now is and of that which is to come. Proverbs 16 says, the silver-haired head is a crown of glory. It is found in the way of righteousness. In other words, the man who has disciplined him himself to grow in righteousness. So exercise yourself diligently in the short term that you may be strong in the end and finish well. Don't think that you can put off exercising spiritually until later. And I know some people set goals. I'm gonna do all these exercising, the physical ones. And it's hard to keep those. You know, maybe many will do that today or tomorrow. So... You wanna be strong at the end. You don't wanna think, well, I have plenty of time to do that. I can start practicing those disciplines or getting serious about them later. You don't know the number of days that you have and you should not presume you can get hurriedly ready or prepared for that day. In other words, the steady plotter in exercise is usually much better than the very infrequent workout. I brought this book up here. There's some in the back. There's some in the office. We've given it to all of you. Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. I don't know of a better summary of the disciplines of grace and, and ideas for application than this book.
So we finish well through discipline and, brothers and sisters, by accepting God's discipline. Hebrews 12 says, My son, do not despise the chastening or the discipline of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Amen? He chastens us, and he does it lovingly and for a very good purpose. He wants us to be finishers, certainly. Verse 11 of that passage, Hebrews 12, says, Now no chastening or no discipline seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Maybe you know that when you work out. You feel that way. But you have a goal. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. What a goal, to end your life with the peaceable fruit of righteousness, the blessing of the crown of righteousness. So being disciplined by our loving Heavenly Father is part of our training to be finishers and accepting it, receiving it, pressing forward with what he wants to do through that in our lives. Parents, you're all, you're all doing this, you're all seeking to do this with your children so that they can be finishers. So let us, may we receive those disciplines from the Lord and learn from it. Well, we finish well by relying on God's promises. One example of many, I could have said hundreds here, but this is the one I just came upon, and oh, this is wonderful. Isaiah 46, verse four. Even to your old age, I am he, meaning I am God. And even to your gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made you and I will bear. Even I will carry and I will deliver you. Wow, what a promise. There are many, hundreds and hundreds of promises, dear family. May we finish well. That, that is a promise I, I rejoice in. Many of you know Psalm 92. Many of us uh, of, of my generation know this passage very well, Psalm 92, verses 12 through 25. I'm just gonna read a few. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. They shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those are very big and tall. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. In other words, they will be in the presence of the Lord. That's why they will be strong. But then it says this, they shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Second Corinthians 4 tells us that indeed the outward man is perishing. But the inward man, by God's grace, is being renewed day by day. So we can bear fruit in old age. I want to bear fruit in old age. I want you to bear fruit as you grow, as you mature. So we finish well by continuing to grow in our love for the word. That should never be stagnant. Psalm 112 talks about the person who fears the Lord and delights greatly in his commandments. Those two things go together. The person who fears the Lord and greatly loves the word of God King David said this, he, that person, will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast or firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He will not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. It's a good picture of a finisher. Psalm 73, the, uh, the, the uh, psalmist said, my, my flesh and my heart may fail. I am weak sometimes, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Nothing can shake or move this person who loves, meaning practices, the law of God. Psalm 37, 31 says, the law of God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Psalm 119, 165, great peace have those who love your law. Nothing causes them to stumble. So in other words, you can and you will get back up if you love the word of God. Saints who love the law of God who love his word, do not have to worry that they will slip or stumble. I mean, worry is a waste of strength anyway. But finishers will cry out to the Lord for a heart of love for his word, more than they have now. They will cry out for that. They will cry out and be steadfast in disciplining themselves in the word. So the Lord has determined that we must put our faith into action. Uh, the book of James makes this clear. Uh, faith without works is dead. So here's a suggested application here. Psalm 119. 
about once a year I do this, uh, but I go through Psalm 119, and I pray each verse of that. So go through that, Psalm 119. Go through it slowly and meditate on it and pray that verse that you will be a word-centered person and thus you will help others to become word-centered. It might change your life. Okay, we finish well by having an eternal perspective, by having a generational view of your life. Not, not a, you know, just now kind of thing. But and it's also by casting a vision. So you have a vision and you want to cast it like, like uh, Caleb did that we've been hearing in Joshua. So the psalmist said this in Psalm 71, O God, you have taught me from my youth, and to this day I declare your wondrous works. Now also, when I am old and gray-headed, O God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. That's the vision of a finisher, of a man who wants to make finishers, actually, to help other people finish. And we've been listening, and I reviewed the sermons uh, that Phil has preached, three of those, on Caleb, a man with a God-shaped vision. It was very good to review. And he talked about Caleb uh, being a man who did share his vision, and he did not allow others to kill his faith, the negative ones. But he kept this vision even to his old age. He kept fighting, in fact, to his old age. And that was all by pressing into the Lord, delighting in the Lord. So again, part of our finishing well, I believe, is helping others finish well. Isaiah 50, this is uh, talking about the Lord Jesus, a prophecy. It says, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint and I know that I will not be ashamed. Matthew Henry said, our Lord went on in his work as mediator with unshaken constancy and undaunted resolution. He did not fail, nor was discouraged. Brothers and sisters, our Lord set his face to go to his death, and he finished for us. Luke 9 says, now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to Jerusalem. He set his face like a flint. That's what that means. Charles Spurgeon said, my great, he was saying this to the, the saints there, my great object is to lead you to love him who loved you so that he set his face like a flint in his determination to save you. Oh, you redeemed ones, on whose behalf this strong resolve was made, you who have been bought by the precious blood of this steadfast, resolute redeemer, come and think a while of him that your hearts may burn within you and that your faces may be set like flints to live and die for him who lived and died for you. Amen. Maybe so. Our Lord Jesus is really for us the perfect example of a finisher. In his life he did all things well. Mark 7. And they were astonished beyond measure saying he has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the dumb speak. And even in his last moments on the cross, Our dear Savior, in unimaginable physical pain, and with the burden of the wrath of God, which he took for us upon him, he finished well. John 17, in his final prayer for us, for his people, as he prepared his disciples for his coming, crucifixion, and for his death, he said, he prayed to his Father in heaven, he said, I have glorified you on the earth, I have finished the work which you have given me to do. May we say this when the Lord calls us home. May we say this in any given task, actually, any given day leading up to our final one. In fact, I think as I was thinking about this, I was mostly thinking about the end of my day, but I also thought how important it is on any given day to have the habit of finishing any task well. Colossians 3.23, whatever your task, work heartily as serving the Lord and not men. And it talks about the inheritance after that. So, we finish well by keeping Jesus as our goal. He is our vision. Even knowing that tribulations and death awaited him did not deter him, did not deter Paul from pressing on. He did not take his eyes off the goal of saving us. 
Many martyrs have said similar things. I will not recant. I will not turn from Jesus. I will go to my death. So our Lord Jesus is the focus, really, uh, and, and the purpose of our discipline. We don't just do discipline because we love discipline. We do it because we want to follow our Lord Jesus. He is our goal and he is our example. Our relationship with him indeed is our strength and our joy. Psalm 25, 15 says, David said, my eyes are ever on the Lord for he will pluck my feet out of the net. So when you are having a battle and you are really stuck in a net, David said, well, my eyes are always toward him. He's the only one who can extricate me from this net that I'm stuck in. So our eyes should always be set on him. Again, he is at the goal line. And he indeed is our goal. Christ likeness is our goal of character. C.T. Studd said this. He was a missionary on three major continents. He said, only one life twill soon be passed. In other words, we have one physical life. Only one life twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's why we do all these as unto him. That's what a finisher is like. He knows those, he wants to do those things that last because it's done for the Lord Jesus. So he finished his race with joy. He carried it out uh, by grace, his ministry. And you remember earlier I shared that one of his goals was to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. He meant that to the end, to his dying breath. I'm, I'm sure he did. But earlier in his life, this is what he was going through. And he didn't quit here either. This is in 1 Corinthians 11. From the Jews, I received five times, uh, 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in the water. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, all those things, he said, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. His deep concern for all the saints. He had that on him, but he, ne- he finished. He didn't end. As he, can you imagine going through that? Early on in the Navigator, Sherry and I, this is 50 some years ago. Why I remember this, I'm sure it's of the Lord, but uh, I remember a number of, they weren't called sermons, they were exhortations. Every Friday night, the 300 of us or whatever new believers on campus in Lincoln would get together and sing like crazy and hear the word preached. It was was wonderful. Uh, But for some reason, I remember uh, a lot of sermons on the long haul. The long haul. And... uh, you know, follow hard after the Lord until he calls you home. We were 18 years old, you know. And I wasn't sure why then, maybe as much, but I, I am now. And when you're young, you know, you don't think uh, as often as it might be good that you could be called home soon. You might be tempted to think in the general course of things, I have a lot of time left. You might be tempted to not get back up, so to speak, or to keep running or to keep fighting. Because, you know, I can do that later, I'm, I'm, I, I'm too tired, whatever it may be. Hebrews 12, again, one through three, talks about getting rid of the weight of sin. So you, you, know, you, so you discipline yourself. This is something I, I saw also. In 1968, in the Olympics, this was the Mexico Olympics. Uh, this happened actually in several Olympics, but this is the one I, I found in uh, a man from, named John Stephen Ackware, he's from Tanzania, uh, w- he came in the stadium and he was hobbling and his right leg was bloody and bandaged and he just was staggering basically. Uh, but he, he staggered in the stadium more than, well more, more than an hour after the winner had crossed the finish line. And of course everybody who was left stood up and gave him a standing ovation and he inspired them. But uh, this is what he said after they interviewed him. You know, he could have, people wouldn't even known. He would have been back there wherever he fell down. But he said this, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start a race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. 
dear family, the Lord has sent us to finish and finish well. And he gives us grace to do it. Daniel shared also about Eric Little, remember in Chariots of Fire where he got bumped and he fell over and everybody ran ahead of him. But he got back up, didn't he? Nobody expected him to win. Actually, he did win. Gave it all he had and he collapsed at the end. So we're called, dear family, and we're sent by our captain to finish well. He enabled us, he enabled us to start it well, to start this race, and he enables us to finish. He is our example of, of a finisher. So again, looking unto Jesus, the finisher, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, similar to what Paul said, he endured the cross for us. He despised the shame. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 tells us that his grace is sufficient in these battles that we've talked about to be a finisher, sufficient grace to have the strength to finish so that he will receive the glory. Not we, hey, I discipline myself so much, look at me. His grace is the one that makes us sufficient. So we're able to press on. He gives us vitality and strength as we delight in him. Now for Paul, the goal, uh, the finish line was very soon. It was in sight. It was very near, and he knew that. And he had pressed toward that goal his whole life, his whole Christian life. And he'd been doing that since he wrote Philippians 3. I pressed toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, related to pressing on, we're to learn to finish our full race by being faithful and finishing, again, the many, many small things, the many, many battles and challenges that we face. We, we learn how to be finishers, and we get practice in being finishers as we do that. Those little things are important. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, Luke 16. So the habit of doing your best, in other words, going the extra, extra mile, getting back up and finishing any task well, it gives us the mindset then of a finisher. And I brought some of these, the habit of going the extra mile. I put some in the back. I would suggest that also. So doing just enough, dear family, is not glorifying to the Lord. It doesn't help us to have the heart of a finisher. Our Lord Jesus on the cross said, it is finished. That was his victory cry. He finished his task to save his people. May we be faithful to the end like our Lord Jesus. Indeed, we are to be faithful and we're to finish everything we do for the glory of the Lord with excellence. And we're meant to help each other again in that. One way over the years that the Phil and I and Rodney, uh, over the years have had a yearly focus. We, we thought that was helpful. Uh, we would have more sharing on that, more times of shepherding on that focus. And this year, I think you all know, it's 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. And we're gonna be talking about thankfulness, thanksgiving, gratefulness. That will be the theme of, uh, of our year, so to speak. It's also the theme of the Spring Presbytery, and it's the theme of my sermon next week. Finally, brothers and sisters, keep the faith. Matthew Henry said that Paul had kept the doctrines of the gospel and never betrayed any of them. And Paul now was seeking to encourage Timothy, he wrote this letter to Timothy, to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He's looking at Timothy as part of his finishing. You know, he's casting the vision like Caleb did. So he's thinking of ongoing ministry, ongoing proclamation of the gospel. That was his heart. And he wanted Timothy to finish his calling in that. So again, finishing well is helping others to finish well. First Timothy 6, Paul urged Timothy, fight the good fight of the faith. This is in his first letter. He said the same thing in this letter. Fight the good fight of the faith. In other words, keep the faith that was declared in the scriptures like he had done. In, uh, chap in verses three through five of 2 Timothy, he told Timothy, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. There'll be a whole range of people not enduring sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they just, you know, they just wanna hear new stuff. They will heap up for themselves teachers. They'll gather all the teachers they can around them who will not preach sound doctrine 
and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. This is not what he's telling Timothy. To Timothy, he said right after that, but you, be watchful in all things, careful, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, that was his particular calling, and fulfill your ministry, finish it. So we are blessed also, dear family, to have a confession, the Westminster Confession, as we have been going through. We have the Heidelberg Catechism that we can rejoice in. We have the creeds, which help us stay the course in our doctrine. Now you hear of some pastors and whole churches and denominations that just drift off into false doctrine, into weak theology, into syncretism, And the enemy in the world are certainly seeking to cause us to drift, to not keep the faith, to not stick to the gospel, to not speak against error and unbiblical doctrine or so-called truth. So each of us has a part, again, in the body. We have a role in, in, in this with those who are struggling right now in the fight, in the race. We need to encourage them to keep the faith, to keep the whole counsel of God, the gospel, and pray Dear family, I know you do pray. Phil and I know you pray for your elders to keep the faith. To say, according to Psalm 92, that we will be declaring that the Lord is upright at the end of our days. So remember, who is at the finish line? And what is at the finish line? The Lord Jesus is there, and he's there with a crown. Amazing. Even if you think that is a long way off. Well, verse eight says, Finally, there is laid up for me, let me say it this way. Finally, there is laid up for you the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to you on that day and to all who have loved his appearing. Paul rejoiced in the crown waiting him by God's grace through faith in Christ. And his righteousness was, he understood, imputed to him. Praise praise God. But here, Paul was very close to the time when it would be realized And he would have no hindrance, no more struggle against sin. Nothing stopping him from seeing his glorious Lord. So there are three action words here to conclude. Fought, finished, and kept. Paul fought well. He was engaged in battle. He never disengaged himself. He got up when literally beaten down. And he finished well. He kept getting up. Nothing could move him, he said, off that course he was on. And he ended well. And he kept the truth of the word of God. He never swerved in doctrine. He proclaimed the gospel until his death. Dear saints, do what it takes to finish any task well, to finish 2024 well. Indeed, work and plan to finish your life well. Fight on, run on as you look to Jesus. Keep the precious word of God. May it be the joy and delight of your heart even more and more and look forward to the crown from the Lord when you meet him at the finish line. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we are weak, but we want to finish. We want to finish well for the glory of your holy name. And so Lord, I pray now for us all that we would each fight the good fight of the faith, that we would run with all that is within us in this course that we are on, by your calling and by your sovereign will. Lord, may we cling to your promises. And when we are weary or we're beaten down or at the end of our own strength, may we go forward in your strength and with you. For we ask this by faith in the one who finished for us, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.